deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Let us pray. O oh, gracious Lord, in these moments, speak to us. Help us to put aside those worries, those things we need to do. Help us to be fully open to hear your word, to know your presence, and to experience your nudgings in our hearts. Amen. In our lesson here from the Gospel of John, Jesus is dried off from his baptismal dip in the Jordan River the day before, and he is out, out where people can see him. John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, happens to be standing with a couple of his disciples when he catches sight of Jesus. John declares, look, here is the Lamb of God. Now, following that declaration, two of John's disciples, ones who were standing with him, turn their attention to Jesus. Their curiosity is piqued. They leave John because they want to know more about Jesus. They want to hear what Jesus has to say so they, they can decide for themselves who he really is. Upon catching up to Jesus, they call him rabbi, and they express their desire to be with him, to learn from him. They are respectful. They wait to see Jesus, to, to, to hear Jesus' invitation for them to come. The fact that they call him rabbi which means teacher, makes it clear to us that they do not yet fully understand who he is. Jesus invites them to come and see. The Greek word here for see literally means know, perceive, understand. So Jesus invites the two to come with him so that they might know, perceive, and understand who he really is. He invites them into a deeper level of curiosity that tr transcends superficial acquaintance. This deeper level will require an investment, an investment of time, and eventually resources. John's two disciples welcome Jesus' invitation. They go with him, and by the end of that day, they are calling him Messiah. Andrew was one of those two disciples of John who spent time listening to and getting to know Jesus. He is truly excited about what he heard and what he has perceived to be true. In fact, he is so thoroughly convinced of the extraordinariness of Jesus that he goes to his brother, Simon, and tells him the good news. We have found the Messiah. Andrew then take Simon to introduce him to Jesus. Relational curiosity can be very contagious. So now it's Simon's turn to spend time with Jesus. And as he does so, he also comes to see in Jesus what his brother had already seen. Both brothers are now committed to a relationship with Jesus, to following Jesus. Next, Jesus runs into Philip. He is from Bethsaida, the same hometown as, as Andrew and Peter. He says to Philip, follow me. Soon Philip is also so excited about meeting and knowing Jesus that he wants to share this amazing news 
this exciting relationship with someone else. Philip goes, he goes and he finds his good friend Nathaniel. Philip tells Nathaniel that he has met the long promised Messiah in Jesus, a man from Nazareth. But Nathaniel had some preconceived ideas about people from Nazareth. He questioned, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Clearly, he did not think much of those who came from Nazareth. Did he personally have a bad run-in with a Nazarene? Perhaps it was simply, simply the dynamics of small-town rivalries. Rivalries between towns were well known in those days. Those rivalries were not unlike our rivalries today between neighboring school systems that compete in sports. Of course, another possibility might have been derogatory rumors, gossip from others, which Nathaniel had taken to heart. Initially, Philip's excitement about meeting the Messiah did not seem to compel Nathaniel's sense of curiosity. He had jumped to a conclusion, made up his mind, and that was basically that. Likely no amount of talk was going to convince him otherwise. Have you ever known someone like that? It doesn't matter how narrow-minded, lopsided, even illogical their position, because nothing is going to change their minds. You can talk until you are hoarse. You can point out the errors in their position. You can offer factual data to the contrary or you can just simply share why you think otherwise. And still their position is not likely to change. Maybe you and I are occasionally that person, which is something we should probably consider, especially in this day when lines seem to be being drawn everywhere, all over the place. It's never a good idea to arrive at a premature conclusion about anyone or to otherize them based on insufficient knowledge. And yet, we too often do just that. Apparently, Philip knew better than to argue with his friend. So he didn't really try. Philip simply extended the same invitation Jesus had extended to him earlier. Come and see. It was an invitation to be curious, to meet someone his friend had met. Certainly Nathaniel could hear and see his friend's excitement. As friends, Nathaniel and Philip's relationship, certainly it included some respect, trust, concern, support. If Nathaniel and Philip had been strangers or simply acquaintances, Nathaniel may have never taken the time and gone out of his way to meet a man from Nazareth. But Philip was his friend, so Nathaniel honors his friend's request, and he goes. When Nathaniel came face to face with Jesus, he was immediately surprised by what Jesus said. Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Any devout Jew of that day would recognize this as a huge compliment. He was not expecting a compliment from a man from Nazareth. And so he was thrown off guard a bit by it. He wanted to know how Jesus could possibly know him well enough to come to such a conclusion. Jesus recounted Nathanael sitting under a fig tree and meditating on God's promises. It's possible that Jesus had visibly seen Nathanael at some time in passing, and yet he also seemed to know Nathanael's dreams, his prayers, the most intimate and secret longings of his heart and mind. That's how he could say that he was a man of no deceit. Jesus knows Nathanael is a good and a faithful man, even though he had allowed his personal judgments about certain people to creep into his heart. As Nathaniel stood before the one who knew him, and
and his heart, his defenses just started to melt away. He let go of his stubborn opinions, his rash judgments, as he prioritized for himself a relationship with Jesus of Nazareth. Many scholars believe that Nathaniel was also known by the name Bartholomew, which means he was among the inner circle of Jesus' 12 disciples. Nathaniel began his walk with Jesus all because a friend had been curious enough about Jesus to spend some time talking to him, getting to know him, and then with excitement shared that with a friend, reached out to his friend and invited him to come and meet and see and, and to know Jesus, the Jesus he had recently come to know. Jesus' ministry began with one invitation after another to come, to get to know him, to be in a personal relationship with him. This development of personal relationships was foundational not just at the beginning of his ministry, but throughout his entire ministry. In this artistic statement, the artist who was a contributor to this sermon series invites us to notice the diversity of each disciple in our John passage and the fact that each one has a different idea who Jesus is. Jesus is all those things and more. And we are each invited to discover the fullness of who Jesus is through our relationships with one another. So how do we cultivate a deeper curiosity that encourages us into a fuller understanding of others as, as well as Jesus? Too often our, our tendency is to not be curious. And not to have a desire to get to know others who, who look, dress, think differently than we do. And yet a relationship with Jesus and with those he loves always requires an investment of time and resources to get to know them. It also requires a commitment to unlearning prior assumptions. According to today's passage, the best way to get someone's attention and show them something different and worthwhile is to personally engage them and to invite them to know you as you make it clear that you want to know them as well. That's how Jesus and his disciples established relationships. Last Sunday, we heard a message from Reverend Lisa Withrow, the church consultant that we have been working with, several of us have been working with, meeting with since February. One of the early things we heard her say to us when we met with her was, you cannot program your way out of church decline. For years, we have mostly been of the mindset that if we meet and focus on strategic planning, like improving and making worship more attractive and offering the exact right programs, that those things will bring people into the church. How many times in the past 50 years have pastors as well as church leaders and members met to develop mission statements, to set goals, to do strategic planning? I don't know. But what I do know is that in the last nine years since I've been your pastor, I can identify basically three times when we seriously focused on goal setting and strategic planning. In all sincerity, we hoped each time that growth would just be the result. Certainly such times generated some excitement as we established new team ministries, started new programs, and yet we didn't really see much change. Of course, when lives are touched in a helpful, life-affirming, faith-infusing way, God is certainly present, and there is blessing in that. Yes, people have clearly known Christ, been impacted by that knowledge and relationship over the years in this place. But still, the overall decline has not changed. 
We are not in a better place when it comes to filling the pews for worship. More people engaging in outreach and mission and having enough money to balance that budget. Reverend Withrow helped us understand that more and better programs do not and are not turning around churches. So what we need to do is move past our frustrations, because we're frustrated, our frustrations that those out there are not that interested in coming into the church to avail themselves of our program to get to know us. They are not particularly interested in knowing us and having a relationship with us. So what if we started doing things differently by following Jesus' example of going to, connecting with, and encouraging the development of life-impacting relationships? Jesus' example of meeting others where they are and listening to them might just work better than what we've been doing with our old field of dreams mantra. If you build it, they will come. So instead of focusing on new programs, we are going to focus for a while on being present for one another, connecting with one another on a personal level, and developing deeper relationships with one another. That doesn't mean we are going to stop all programming. No, we are not. We are still going to worship and have children's worship and Sunday school and those things. But it does mean that we want to try and prioritize relationship building. That is why we are having roundtable discussions. We want to encourage deeper relationships with more people that are characterized by knowledge, by trust, by respect and concern. If we can broaden and deepen our relationships with one another in this faith community through conversations, then perhaps we can figure out how to expand our relationship building by having meaningful conversations with those in our community. Jesus called individuals to come and see, to know and trust, and to be in a life-changing, heart-compelling relationship with him. His ministry began and grew by way of loving, caring, and life-infusing relationships. So let's be curious and serious about getting to know one another and building relationships as we ask and answer the question, where are you from? And may the developing of relationships both inside and outside the church be our priority as we follow Jesus' lead into the future. And so with that, I invite you to now stand.